Welcome, everyone. I guess you can hear me. <laughs> I can hear myself echoing. Um, good morning and welcome into this day with a Quimper UU Fellowship. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, whomever you love, and whatever your faith tradition, you are welcome here. My name is Susan Pratt, and I'm a member of QUF. I'd like to begin this service by acknowledging that Port Townsend is the traditional territory of the Sklalem and Chimicum peoples. We honor and acknowledge our indigenous neighbors and friends and promise to help restore and sustain their homelands. As we begin our time together, let us settle our minds and calm our hearts with the ringing of the chime. It is so good to be together again. I'd now like to welcome Kristen Smith and George Stanley, who will lead us in our call to community, hymn number 21, For the Beauty of the Earth. Please stand if you'd like. Thank you for your patience. Please join me now in our chalice lighting words. They were written by Kathy A. Huff. Divine spark from sacred dark, symbol of our holy intent, illuminate this hour. Our opening words are by Amy Mackenzie Quinn. Welcome to this common, sacred space. Common because we are all welcome. Sacred because we are here to transform the ordinary and attend to the profound. We carry with us our regrets, doubts, and fears. Stories, laughter. May they inspire our worship. 
Above all, may we each meet what we most need to find on this day in this common sacred space. Today's responsive reading is by Clinton Lee Scott. From the east comes the sun, bringing a new and unspoiled day. It has passed over mountain ranges and the waters of the seven seas. It has beheld proud cities with gleaming towers. And also the of the poor. It has been witness to both good and evil, the work of honest people and the conspiracy of knaves. Now unsullied from its tireless journey, it comes to us, the messenger of the morning. I'd now like to welcome Bo Olgren, the Director of Family Ministry. Good morning, everyone. Today in RE, we are continuing to explore our senses in our preschool class. We are exploring our divination with our taste buds, as well as continuing on attacking our environmental horcrux in our later elementary class. And in our middle school class, we are exploring spheres of influence uh, and also prepping for a visit from one of our local um, pagan practitioners, Jennifer Rodermund, next week. So those of you who are on the aisle, if you will please stand as you are willing or able before we sing out our kids, that would be fabulous. Thank you, Bo, and thanks to all of you musicians. I am continually amazed at what wonderful musical talent we have here. Now, let us acknowledge and welcome those who are visiting us this morning. If you are visiting us online, you are invited to say hello in the chat section. Tell us your name and where you're from. The chat section can be found below or on the right-hand side of the video when it is out of full screen mode. If you are attending the service in person, please stand as, as you're able or raise your hand so that we may welcome you. Yes. Oh, lots of you. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. We're glad that you are with us today. And don't forget, you can stay a little while after, after uh, the service to have coffee in the foyer and to talk with members. We'd now like to receive the offering, which today goes to Bayside Housing. I would like to welcome Heather Dudley and Mike Moore, who will tell us a little more about Bayside. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? This is positioned right? Great. So I'm Heather dudley Nolette. This is Mike Moore. We're from Bayside Housing and Services. Um, we'll just uh, take just two quick minutes of your time. And um, when we talk about Bayside Housing and Services, which provides 
transitional supportive housing, and soon we're about to embark on our first permanent supportive housing program. And I might tell you a little bit about the supportive piece in a moment. When we talk about that to our community, um, I look out to this community and I see so many familiar and beloved friends and neighbors, and I'm so glad to be welcomed here, so thanks for having us. Um, and I also know this is a community that is as educated, as more, certainly much more educated and knowledgeable than most, I'd say, in our community about housing issues. Um, and so today we're just going to focus our two minutes on the piece of the housing spectrum, if we were to look at it as a linear thing, which we know it isn't actually, but if you consider being in a homeless condition on one side of that spectrum and being fully housed in a market rate home um, and you know the sort of the highest of that spectrum and we th when we think of that economically, Bayside Housing and Services is really working with people coming out of the homeless condition into a transitional but supported situation, and now we're about to move into um, also being able to provide some permanent housing through a new purchase of the Hadlock Motel, which Mike has been working really, really hard on, and we hope to close on within the next week. We hope to move that into transitional housing immediately, pulling folks off our wait list, and then moving into permanent. But. Um, Maybe, Mike, you could focus just a minute on, um, on the supported part, the case management piece, which Mike's team leads. And while Mike's talking, if you would just imagine um, a, a series of unfortunate events in your life or in the life of someone that you care about, and the support that you would look to in your life to help you through that series of unfortunate events, and that's what we're really trying to do at, at Bayside, is to provide that support to folks who don't otherwise have the support systems that I hope we all have in each other. All right. Uh, I'm Mike. Um, so I, I think you can just pull uh -oh. it up to your chin. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Technology. How interesting. All right. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the permanent supported housing that we do as we go out. And I was asked earlier today, how do we bring people in or what is the criteria for that? And really, we're just looking for the most vulnerable people. So they apply to our program right now. Our wait list is about 80 people. We have right around 42 um, rooms that we house out, either, whether it be in uh, Port Townsend, the Pat's Place, or Peter's Place down in Port Hadlock, or the old alcohol plant has about 20 rooms in itself that we use for that transitional housing. As we bring people in, we work with them with our case managers to, um, basically our, our goal is to find them permanent housing. Uh, within this area, as many of you know, it's very difficult to find permanent housing, so always the supply is an issue. We also work with them on employment, trying to find mm -hmm. adequate employment for them that meets their needs as they move through it, so creating those goals together. We also reach out to a lot of our organizations in our community to help that wraparound service that Heather was talking about. Several of these people don't have families in the area um, or a network that brings them that support and that care, so we work with them to develop that piece of it. Um, and as they move on, we continue that support if they need it uh, as they reach out to us. So um, we house currently about 52 people. Uh, about a quarter of that is children, so we work with families pretty closely. Um, and then, as we bring people in, we realize we wish we could bring them all in. Um, and as Heather was saying, we're about to open up uh, the Port Hadlock Motel, and we'll switch it over to Woodley Place, and that'll provide us another 17 rooms. But that 17 rooms is just a dent in our current population that doesn't have homes. So we're continually looking, searching for ways to rectify the situation of the housing crisis. Um, and just thank you for all of your support. And it does take a community to come together. Uh, we couldn't do it without everybody involved in Jefferson County and outside of that. Um, as it goes, we are a nonprofit, so we largely are funded by grants and generous donors. And um, not only financially, but also just that community support and the need to advocate for 
the people that can't advocate for themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Heather and Mike. If you'd like to donate to this worthy cause, now you have a few options. If you are in the sanctuary, the ushers will come around and receive the offerings of those of you who are here in person. If you are viewing online, uh, you can me text the number you would like to give to the number that you can now see on the bottom of your screen, or uh, you may go to our website, quuf.org, and click on the giving link, or else just mail a check to QUUF. Just remember to write Bayside in the memo line. We will now greatly receive your offerings as we listen to Jay Unger's beautiful Ashokan Farewell, played by Kristen and Otto Smith, Ida and Bruce Domas Licky, and Kathleen Croston. Thank you, A Joyful Noise. We have an announcement from our healthy community team. On Sundays through December during coffee hour, the healthy community team will host a series of drop-in conversation circles from 11 to 12 in the den. These are an opportunity to connect face-to-face -face and discuss topics which are important right now. 
A couple of questions will be used as prompts, one related to the sermon topic, another more generally relevant to QUUF. Please join us and engage with your Quimper Unitarian Universalist Fellowship neighbors in recreating community. This past semester, ALPS ran a variety of programs, ranging from discussion groups to field trips to classes. It's a time now for you to think about putting on your thinking cap to consider what class you might like to lead in the spring. Proposals for ALPS spring semester 2023 are due on December 3rd. Submit your proposal by clicking on the ALPS info button on the QUUF homepage. And now I would like to introduce Teddy Fernandez with another lively auction announcement. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Teddy Fernandez, and as your official auction mascot, I'm here to tell you we're going to have a honey of an auction. Do you know that bidding officially starts today? Well, it does. All bidding is online. It will be open until Sunday, November 20th at 5 p.m. I have to be honest with you. I can barely start to wait bidding. <laughs> have you already reg registered to bid? If so, then bid away. If not, all the information and links are in your weekly update and on the website. Did we get wonderful donations from all of you? You bet. People did not hibernate, but they did donate. <laughs> Generously, check out the online auction catalog. There's a gorgeous painting in the foyer by Diane Ainsworth. There are vacation up paintings, there are vacation offerings, excuse me, including stays in Uptown, Cannon Beach, and a cabin on the coast. Cakes, pies, and cookies galore, art, jewelry, meals. There are classes in music, crafting, and Spanish. We even have gift certificates for a massage, local restaurants, and dog Townsend. Auction committee members led by Carol Graves and Deb Carroll have created a special gallery in the fellowship hall so that we may all preview the catalog items in person. It's now open. It will be open this week whenever the office is open. But you must please join me at the Teddy Bear Picnic Auction event on Friday, November 18th, this Friday at 6 p.m. Please get your tickets today or soon. It will help the planning team make sure we don't run out of marshmallows. Marshmallows at a bonfire are, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, bear necessities. <laughs> and now to tell you more about our auction, here is Sigrid. Thank you, Teddy. I have to say our mascot this year, Teddy Fernandez, is certainly giving his all and is not doing just the bare minimum. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am Sigrid Cummings. As Teddy said, this Friday, November 18th, is our Teddy Bear Auction event. It starts at 6 p.m. There will be light bites, drinks, and two bonfires in the garden. And I have to say, the weather forecast right now looks pretty favorable for that. We'll get a chance to test out our s'mores making skills. There will be an opportunity to view the auction items, including the amazing array of artwork that Karen Page's family have donated to us. George Stanley will play his guitar and lead us in singing everyone's perennial favorite, Puff the Magic Dragon. <laughs> Covenant groups and teams have donated 10 delightful raffle gift baskets, and you can buy your raffle tickets during the party. Tickets are $1 each. For you bargain hunters out there, you can get 10 tickets for only $5, and if you're really hardcore, $10 will nail you 25 tickets. So, please bring cash or a check for your raffle tickets. I will be your MC for the auction program that starts at 7. I'm so excited that Joseph Bednarik will be joining me for Fund a Need. There will be music and the Grand Teddy Bear Picnic Slideshow. I've been told we have over 60 pictures already. Yeah, it should be fun. <laughs> if you can't be there in person, you can join us on the live stream. 
Your link to the 7 p.m. teddy bear auction program will come a couple of days before the event, so please watch your emails, and the link will also be in the Friday update. If you have pre-ordered your goodie bag, please pick it up on November 15th or 16th between the hours of 10 and 1 or at the live event. And finally, I'm excited to tell you about this year's Fund a Need project. How do we fund long-term security for our beloved QUUF? We have financial reserves set in place for difficult times like the COVID pandemic or extra hiring costs for ministers. And knowing that we have money to weather the ups and downs for funding flow is necessary for maintaining QUUF for future generations. So this year, we decided to give directly to the QUUF reserves. I know this may not be as exciting as a piece of high-tech equipment, but it does show our dedication and commitment to the future of our beloved community. You can make your contributions to our financial reserves by donating to the Fund a Need starting right now online at the auction website. And I'm pleased to announce that some people have already made their contributions. So thank you all for the support that you give to QUUF. Your donations to the auction and fund a need will help us to realize our goals. So bear with me as I remind you one more time. Please get your tickets to this Friday's live event, November 18th, as soon as possible and start your bidding on our wonderful auction items. Bidding starts today at noon. Thank you. Many thanks to our speakers. We will now share our joys and sorrows, recognizing that our personal joys and sorrows are only a fragment of the joys and sorrows of the larger community of life. Thus, we place this first stone, thinking in particular of all those who took time to vote this last week. We give thanks for a peaceful voting day and for all those who upheld the democratic process through voting. And now within the congregation, we light a candle of joy for member Gary Forbes. Last week, Gary received the Internal Medicine Physician of the Year Award for Washington State from the Washington chapter of the American College of Physicians. <laughs> this award is for being a champion and role model to peers. This is great timing and a wonderful way to enter into retirement. And now we place a final stone holding in our hearts the joys and sorrows that I've just shared, but also thinking of such joys and sorrows among us that are unexpressed, but of no less importance. I invite you now into a moment of silence. Today's reading comes from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. This must be a simply enormous wardrobe, thought Lucy, 
going still further in and pushing the soft folds of coats aside to make room for her. Next moment, she found that what was rubbing against her face and hands was no longer the soft fur of coats, but something hard and rough and even prickly. Why, it's just like the branches of trees, exclaimed Lucy. And then she saw that there was a light ahead of her, not a few inches away where the back of the wardrobe ought to have been, but a long way off. Something cold and soft was falling on her. A moment later, she found that she was standing in the middle of a wood at nighttime with snow under her feet and snowflakes falling through the air. Lucy felt a little frightened, but she felt very inquisitive and excited as well. She looked back over her shoulder, and there, between the dark tree trunks, she could still see the open doorway of the wardrobe and even catch a glimpse of the empty room from which she had set out. Our special music today is Wayfaring Stranger, sung by Chris Copeland, with Carrie Copeland and Kathleen Croston accompanying.
Thank you again. Our guest speaker today, who you've already seen, is a Melody Moberg. This is Melody's second time speaking to us, and she will be joining us about once a month this year. Thank you, Melody. Thank you. Melody is a Unitarian Universalist ministerial candidate from Seattle. She graduated with a Master of Divinity from Seattle University's School of Theology and Ministry in 2022. Welcome. Thank you. Sacred spaces are places that feel holy to us. We usually associate sacred space with religion. We can find sacred space in a mosque, beneath the dome of a cathedral, or in a temple. When I was a child in north central Wisconsin, I invoked sacred space in my yard with a red milk crate. I carried the red milk crate up my driveway and then over to the right into a sumac forest. I followed trampled paths into the forest. I found a small clearing and there I pressed the overturned milk crate onto a patch of sweet-smelling grass. I was only about six feet into the sumac forest. I could still see my driveway and I could still see the road. I could easily call for my parents. But I felt set apart in a private world. I felt connected to the sumac and the grass and the wind. I took deep breaths and felt connected to my deepest self. I had discovered sacred space and claimed it as such. I also found sacred space in the sanctuary of the First Universalist Unitarian Church in Wausau, Wisconsin. I loved the old church smell of the sanctuary, which was built in 1914. I loved how my body felt when I crossed the threshold into its cool, spacious interior. I loved the soaring rafters and the stained glass windows with Christian iconography, which was mostly mysterious to me. But sacred space isn't just found in houses of worship or forest clearings. Sacred space can be evoked. It can be learned. Sacred space can be an outdoor wedding or a vista. It can be a website or a gathering of friends. Sacred space can be something that's intangible. I began seminary at Seattle University in 2016. I was excited to study theology, to learn pastoral care skills, and to study Hebrew and Christian scriptures. I wrestled with big questions about the divine, about suffering and hope, and how we can make meaning in our lives. It was challenging but clarifying to begin my studies during the 2016 election. This showed me viscerally the life-saving importance of liberal religious traditions like Unitarian Universalism. Beginning that fall, I also found myself seeking out young adult audiobooks about magic. This happened after about a decade of being totally uninterested in reading fiction. At first, I thought that I was reading young adult fantasy to connect with my inner child, or that I needed to read something comforting, comfort to counterbalance the intensity of the world or the intensity of studying theology. Ultimately, I realized that this wasn't just a guilty pleasure. Young adult fantasy became a really meaningful part of my seminary journey. Stories about developing hidden senses and learning how to come into one's power felt a lot like my school experience. I was learning how to interpret ancient texts, craft a ritual, and be with people in their grieving. 
I was even learning how to sense the presence of the sacred in conversations with others. And developing these skills felt just like magic. So many lessons from young adult fantasy can be applied to life. Like I read in books by Mercedes Lackey, musicians need, magicians need to learn how to sense and move with their magic. Magic is an art that needs to be practiced and developed. Carry On by Rainbow Rowell showed me the magical power of popular language and that magicians have to guard their magic or risk depleting it. Some spells take enormous energy. Lev Grossman's The Magicians reminded me that intelligence and magical giftedness can be misused by narcissists. And the delightful graphic novel, The Witch Boy, by Molly Knox Ostertag, reiterated the importance of community, multi-generational healing, and coming-of-age rituals to harness one's magic. And The Witch Boy also explores how harmful it can be to gatekeep these kinds of rituals because of gender. The metaphor of magic is applicable to most callings. In the memoir, See No Stranger, sick activist Valerie Kaur describes her education at Yale Law School as a process of learning spells, like a magician. By learning and using the language of the law, Kaur was able to cast a spell of particular words in a particular order which can work magic on our unjust legal system. Core's growing collection of spells could open locked doors and help those at the margins in a particular skillful way, a way that was formerly inaccessible to her. As a hospital chaplain intern, I too discovered the power of using particular language and this was using a patient's particular language in prayer. Praying out loud with patients invokes sacred space in what was previously a hospital room. By using the particular words for the divine most holy to a patient, and the particular words that a patient uses to describe their own suffering, longing, and hope, this honors the language and metaphor that the patient holds sacred, and it invokes the magic of being and feeling truly heard. As a child, when I walked into my sumac clearing and I sat on my red milk crate, I always brought a book with me. And in particular, I read and reread The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, and His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. These books belong to the category of portal fantasy, where a person is transported from this world to another one through a magical portal, like Lucy's wardrobe or a rabbit hole. The sumac clearing and red milk crate were a sacred space to me. It's the place I first tried meditating and the place where I felt, first felt connected to all that is. But the books that I brought with me were also a portal to sacred space, a portal to sacred space found in books, sacred story. When children read, they do it with their whole selves. It's an overwhelming experience to read as a child getting sucked into the story and perceiving the world of the story as though it's real. Adults aren't usually able to access this way of reading anymore. Revisiting the Chronicles of Narnia and his dark materials as an adult, I see that a lot of my sense of the sacred came from reading these books over and over in childhood. Like most kids, I wanted to escape to Narnia. I loved the voyage of the Dawn Treader the most out of the Chronicles. I was particularly bewitched by the story's silver sea at the easternmost edge of the earth. 
The description of this sun-drenched sea with its lily pads and sweet-tasting waters was interfused with a sense of spirituality for me. The silver sea evokes a thin space where the veil between worlds grows thin. In the final volume of His Dark Materials, The Amber Spyglass, I was filled with awe at descriptions of dust, the subatomic particle bringing intelligence to the universe. And I was drawn to the chapters about a parallel world inhabited by elephant-like sentient beings called the Malefa. What drew me to these two books in particular was ironic. The Chronicles of Narnia felt pagan to me but they actually contain very heavy Christian symbolism. C.S. Lewis was a medieval scholar, and he denied that this series was technically an allegory. But once you know that the books have Christian symbolism, it's impossible to not see it. In The Magician's Book, A Skeptic's Adventures in Narnia, the literary critic Laura Miller explores her childhood sense of betrayal when she discovered this Christian symbolism. The flip side of the all-encompassing way that children read books means that they don't perceive allegory or hidden meanings or metaphor in the way that adults do. Miller also explores what was so compelling to her about the Chronicles. There's a pagan element to Narnia that continues to capture the imagination of children. And as a child, I couldn't see the Christianity in Narnia, just its paganism. Miller thinks that this sense of the pagan comes across to readers because C.S. Lewis, so unlike his friend J.R.R. Tolkien, did chaotic mashup world building. He drew from all of the ancient and medieval texts that sparked joy to him. Miller writes, Lewis poured into his imaginary world everything that he had adored in the books he read as a child. Treasures collected from Dante, from Spencer and Mallory, from Austen, from old romances and ballads, fairy tales and pagan epics. Everything that Lewis had ever read and loved went into Narnia. The deep and moving paganism I perceived in Narnia was there because C.S. Lewis, the medievalist, inserted these themes into Narnia from other texts. These passages were portals, too. It's ironic that I felt such religious awe and wonder at his dark materials. Its author, Philip Pullman, is a very well-known atheist. The series was contested when it first came out because of its strong stance against Christianity and Catholicism. The series reframes original sin as a positive thing, and it includes a plot to kill God. But as a child reader, I didn't perceive the series attack on religion. In part, this is because the religion that was built up for attack by Philip Pullman was clearly hollow and empty of life. I just saw the wonder and awe in the worlds unlocked through portal magic. I saw the buzzing religious potential of the sacred, which couldn't be contained by the fallen from grace church, which Pullman depicted. One way to explore and create sacred space in your own life is through building an altar. This can be a corner of a bookshelf, a dedicated piece of furniture, or part of a room. Altars are spaces set apart to remind us of what we hold sacred. They might contain sacred objects, a chalice, pictures of loved ones, flowers, offerings, prayer beads, items collected from nature. Mine always include a lot of rocks. The altar is a sacred space, and these objects are portals. In my mind, there are three steps to creating an altar. One, make space. Two, name what is holy. 
And three, approach with reverence. In Wicca, the practice of casting a circle raises energy and allows magic to happen. A key component of casting a circle is creating a boundary. The sacred boundary protects and it allows energy to amplify within. In making an altar, you start with clearing off space, deciding where the altar will be, removing objects and clutter from that area, cleaning it both to remove dust and dirt, but more intangibly to purify the space of old energy. Maintaining a sacred boundary is a constant practice. We need to create space in our lives to attend to the sacred. Those of you watching the service this morning or in the future have done this by clearing off your calendar, by communicating with loved ones to make a plan to attend or view worship, through waking up on time, following through with this commitment, and moving tasks to the side so you can truly attend to your spirit during this hour. The second step of creating an altar is to name what is holy. This process isn't just intellectual. Here's how you do it. Stop and breathe. Feel into your body and discern what you're, what you're feeling. Connect with your center. And then consider the different images of the holy or sacred names. Spirit of life love, community, mystery. Determine which of these feels holy to you, a little bit or a lot, and which of these words also feels most accessible to you, a word that can quickly connect you to a sense of wonder and awe, and that doesn't hold so much baggage that it's hard to proceed forward. Hold on to this image or name for the sacred. Next, consider your deepest values and most important relationships. And gather sacred items to adorn your altar, which represent the sacred name or the sacred values you hold dear. Looking through the possible items you've collected, choose just a few. Select those most important for your altar today, here and now. An altar is a microcosm. The third step of creating an altar is to approach with reverence. An altar is a physical space which helps us connect to that which is most holy. I used to think that reverence was a passive feeling, but now I think of reverence as a practice. And if reverence is a practice and not a static emotion, that means that we can actively create sacred space in our lives. I once worked at an agricultural intentional community in Pennsylvania called Camp Hill. I was working with people with developmental disabilities. Every mealtime became a practice in reverence together. We would light a candle at the beginning of the meal and sing a song. We'd all hold hands and say, blessing on the meal together. And then at the end of the meal, we would do a special ritual. We would extinguish the candle with a special candle snuffer and then release that smoke up into the air. No one was allowed to leave the table until that small trail of smoke had dispersed. This ritual helped us practice patience and paying attention. It brought a feeling of reverence to a daily routine. And the beautiful thing about reverence is that practicing reverence begets still more reverence. Each time we watched the candle get snuffed out and paid attention to the wispy curl of smoke as it disappeared, we heightened our capacity to perceive wonder and awe in daily life. 
I want to share some particularly tender experiences of sacred space with you. When I was a child, my family would vacation on the shores of Lake Superior every summer. The lake shore looks a lot like the coasts and beaches of the Pacific Northwest. The water is freezing and clear, and the shore is covered in polished stones and sun-bleached driftwood. This place was sacred to my father, who passed away three years ago. I have many memories of my dad standing in Lake Superior, gazing out to the horizon. My dad submerged himself in the freezing water, and this was like a baptism to him. He moved from the sauna to the lake and back again, this an act of purification. When vacationing, my dad was always in search of greater simplicity. The emptiness of the shore helped him finally relax into the moment, as did the freezing water. My dad traveled to southern Wisconsin once to visit the property where the conservationist Aldo Leopold once lived. Afterwards, he wrote a song about it called Aldo Leopold's Shack. It's a funny song, bright, also serious. And in the song, my dad describes the holiness of Aldo Leopold's shack, which was once a chicken coop. Since my dad passed away, I've learned how to play this song on my dad's old guitar. Connecting with my father's music opens a portal for me, a portal which helps me connect with him and remind me of his values, values like conservation, humor, and simplicity. My dad loved to swim. He loved to fish, and he loved to be near water. Our backyard opened up onto the Wisconsin River, and he spent many evenings sitting on the bench by the shore, watching the water and contemplating life. Water, too, can be a sacred space, a sacred space that moves in rivulets and waves, a sacred space that dances across rapids. Water is now an expression of portal magic for me. I feel connected with my dad when I interact with most bodies of water. I feel his presence as I walk along the canal near my house in Seattle or stand in the Puget Sound and look to the blue horizon. May we remember that reverence is a practice. May we remember that we can co-create sacred space together through small intentional practices. A red milk crate, a curl of candle smoke, a guitar chord, or the pages of a book. As we make space, name what is holy, and approach with reverence, we too can build sacred space that we most need in our lives. Blessed be, may it be so. Our closing hymn is hymn number 1011, Return Again. Listen closely. We'll sing it as a round, starting off with everyone singing through the repeats. Then Kristen and George will lead those of you in their half of the congregation in singing the first half of the hymn. And as their folks continue the second half, Chris, Kathleen, and Otto will start the other half of the congregation at the hymn's opening. We can do this. Please stand as you're willing and able and follow your leaders.
Please join us in our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish our flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, the fire of commitment, or the power of transformation. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Next week, Kate Kinney will be speaking on the topic of dancing with thanks. We hope you can join us. Our postlude today is by Pipe Master James Naismith of the Tacoma Clan Gordon, titled Farewell to Camera. The photo is by Ida.